Anton Chekhov Read by Alan Davis Drake After the Theater Nadia Zelenin had just come back with her mama from the theater, where she had seen a performance of Yevgeny Onyegin. Soon after she reached her own room, she threw off her dress, let down her hair, and in her petticoat and white dressing jacket hastily sat down to the table to write a letter like Tatiana's. "'I love you,' she wrote, "'but you do not love me. You do not love me.' She wrote it and laughed. She was only sixteen and did not yet love anyone. She knew that an officer called Gorny and a student called Gruzdev loved her. But now— after the opera, she wanted to be doubtful of their love. To be unloved and unhappy, how interesting that was! There is something beautiful, touching, and poetical about it, when one loves and the other is indifferent. Onyegin was interesting because he was not in love at all, and Tatyana was fascinating because she was so much in love. And if they had been equally in love with each other, and had been happy, they would perhaps have seemed dull. "'Leave off declaring that you love me,' Nadia went on writing, thinking of Gournay. "'I cannot believe it. You are very clever, cultivated, serious. You have immense talent, and perhaps a brilliant future awaits you, while I am an uninteresting girl with no importance.' and you know very well that I should be only a hindrance in your life. It is true that you were attracted by me, and thought you had found your ideal in me, but that was a mistake, and now you are asking yourself in despair, why did I meet that girl? And only your goodness of heart prevents you from owning it to yourself. Nadia felt sorry for herself. She began to cry, and went on. It is hard for me to leave my mother and my brother, or I should take a nun's veil and go whither chance may lead me, and you would be left free and would love another. Oh, if I were dead! She could not make out what she had written through her tears. Little rainbows were quivering on the table, on the floor, on the ceiling, as though she were looking through a prism. She could not write. She sank back in her easy chair and fell to thinking of Gorny. My God, how interesting, how fascinating men were! Nadia recalled the fine expression, ingratiating, guilty, and soft, which came into the officer's face when one argued about music with him, and the effort he made to prevent his voice from betraying his passion. In a society where cold haughtiness and indifference were regarded as signs of good breeding and gentlemanly bearing, one must conceal one's passions. And he did try to conceal them, but he did not succeed, and everyone knew very well that he had a passionate love of music. The endless discussions about music and the bold criticisms of people who knew nothing about it kept him always on the strain. He was frightened timid and silent. He played the piano magnificently, like a professional pianist, and if he had not been in the army he would certainly have been a famous musician. The tears on her eyes dried. Nadia remembered that Gorny had declared his love at a symphony concert, and again downstairs by the hat-stand, where there was a tremendous draught blowing in all directions. I am very glad that you have at last made the acquaintance of Gruzdev, our student friend, she went on writing. He is a very clever man, and you will be sure to like him. He came to see us yesterday and stayed till two o'clock. We were all delighted with him, and I regretted that you had not come. He said a great deal that was remarkable. Nadia laid her arms on the table and leaned her head on them. 
and her hair covered her letter. She recalled that the student, too, loved her, and that he had as much right to a letter from her as Gorny. Wouldn't it be better, after all, to write to Gruzdev? There was a stir of joy in her bosom for no reason whatever. At first the joy was small, and rolled in her bosom like an Indian rubber ball. Then it became more massive, bigger, and rushed like a wave. Nadja forgot Gorny and Gruzdev. Her thoughts were in a tangle, and her joy grew and grew. From her bosom it passed into her arms and legs, and it seemed as though a light, cool breeze were breathing on her head and ruffling her hair. Her shoulders quivered with subdued laughter. The table and the lamp chimney shook, too, and tears from her eyes splashed on the letter. She could not stop laughing, and to prove to herself that she was not laughing about nothing, she made haste to think of something funny. "'What a funny poodle!' she said, feeling as though she would choke with laughter. "'What a funny poodle!' She thought how, after tea the evening before, Gruzdev had played with Maxim, the poodle, and afterwards had told them about a very intelligent poodle who had run after a crow in the yard, and the crow had looked round at him and said, "'Oh, you scamp!' The poodle, not knowing he had to do with a learned crow, was fearfully confused and retreated in perplexity, then began barking. "'No, I had better love Gruzdev. Nadia decided, and she tore up the letter to Gorny. She fell into thinking of the student, of his love, of her love, but the thoughts in her head insisted on flowing in all directions, and she thought about everything, about her mother, about the street, about the pencil, about the piano. She thought of them joyfully, and felt that everything was good, splendid, and her joy told her that this was not all, that in a little while it would be better still. Soon it would be spring, summer, going with her mother to Gorbiki. Gorny would come for his furlough, would walk about the garden with her and make love to her. Gruzdev would come too. He would play croquet and skittles with her. He would tell her wonderful things. She had a passionate longing for the garden, the darkness, the pure sky, the stars. Again her shoulders shook with laughter, and it seemed to her that there was a scent of wormwood in the room, and that a twig was tapping at the window. She went to her bed, sat down, and not knowing what to do with the immense joy which filled her with yearning, she looked at the holy image hanging at the back of her bed, and said, O oh Lord God, O oh Lord God, An Enigmatic Nature On the red velvet seat of a first-class railway carriage, a pretty lady sits half-reclining. An expensive, fluffy fan trembles in her tightly closed fingers. A pince-nez keeps dropping off her pretty little nose. The brooch heaves and falls on her bosom, like a boat on the ocean. She is greatly agitated. On the seat opposite sits the Provincial Secretary of Special Commissions, a budding young author, who from time to time publishes long stories of high life, or novelli, as he calls them, in the leading paper of the province. He is gazing into her face, gazing intently with the eyes of a connoisseur. He is watching, studying, catching every shade of this exceptional, enigmatic creature. He understands it. He fathoms it. Her soul, her whole psychology, lies open before him. Oh, oh, I understand. I understand you to your inmost depths, says the Secretary of Special Commissions, kissing her hand near the bracelet. Your sensitive, responsive soul is seeking to escape from the maze of... Yes, the struggle is terrific, titanic. 
But do not lose heart. You will be triumphant. Yes. Write about me, Valdemar, says the pretty lady with a mournful smile. My life has been so full, so varied, so checkered. Above all, I am unhappy. I am a suffering soul in some page of Dostoevsky. Reveal my soul to the world, Voldemar. Reveal my hapless soul. You are a psychologist. We have not been on the train an hour together, and you have already fathomed my heart. Tell me. I beseech you, tell me. Listen. My father was a poor clerk in the service. He had a good heart and was not without intelligence. But the spirit of the age, of his environment, vous comprenez? I do not blame my poor father. He drank, gambled, took bribes. My mother. But why say more? Poverty, the struggle for daily bread, the consciousness of insignificance. Ah, do not force me to reveal it. I had to make my own way. You know the monstrous education at a boarding school, foolish novel reading, the errors of early youth, the first-time flutter of love. It was awful. The vacillation and the agonies of losing faith in life, in oneself. Ah, you are an author. You know us women. You will understand. Unhappily, I have an intense nature. I looked for happiness. And what happiness? I long to set my soul free. Yes, in that was my happiness. Exquisite creature, murmured the author, kissing her hand close to the bracelet. It's not you I am kissing, but the suffering of humanity. Do you remember Rashkolnikov and his kiss? Oh, Voldemar, I longed for glory, renown. Success like every... Why affect modesty? Every nature above the commonplace. I yearn for something extraordinary, above the common lot of women. And then, and then, there crossed my path an old general, well off. Understand me, Valdemar? It was self-sacrifice, renunciation. You must see that. I could do nothing else. I restored the family fortunes, was able to travel, to do good. Yet, how I suffered, how revolting, how loathing to me were his embraces. Though I will be fair to him, he had fought nobly in his day. There were moments, terrible moments, but I was kept up by the thought that from day to day the old man might die, that I would begin to live as I liked, to give myself to the man I adored, be happy. There is such a man, Voldemar, indeed there is. The pretty lady flutters her fan more violently. Her face takes a lachrymose expression. She goes on. But at last the old man is dead. He left me something. I was free as a bird in the air. Now is the moment for me to be happy, isn't it, Voldemar? Happiness comes tapping at my window. I had only to let it in, but... Voldemar, listen, I implore you. Now is the time for me to give myself to the man I love, to become the partner of his life, to help to uphold his ideals, to be happy to find rest. But how ignoble, repulsive and senseless all our life is. How mean it is, Voldemar. I am wretched, wretched, wretched. But again, there is an obstacle in my path. Again, I feel my happiness is far, far away. Oh, what anguish! If only you knew what anguish. But what? 
What stands in your way? I implore you, tell me. What is it? Another old general. Very well off. The broken fan conceals the pretty little face. The author props on his fist his thoughts, heavy brow, and ponders with the air of a master in psychology. The engine is whistling and hissing while the window curtains flush red with the glow of the setting sun. A JOKE It was noon of a bright winter's day. The air was crisp with frost, and Nadia, who was walking beside me, found her curls, and the delicate down on her upper lip, silvered with her own breath. We stood at the summit of a high hill. The ground fell away at our feet in a steep incline, which reflected the sun's rays like a mirror. Near us lay a little sled, brightly unupholstered with red. Let us coast down, Nadia, I begged. Just once. I promise you nothing will happen. But Nadia was timid. The long slope from where her little overshoes were planted to the foot of the ice-clad hill looked to her like the wall of a terrible yawning chasm. Her heart stopped beating, and she held her breath as she gazed into the abyss while I urged her to take her seat on the sled. What might not happen were she to risk a flight over that precipice? She could die. She would go mad. Come, I implore you, I urged her again. Don't be afraid. It is cowardly to fear, to be timid. At last Nadia consented to go, but I could see from her face that she did so, she thought, at the peril of her life. I seated her, all pale and trembling, in the little sled, put my arms around her, and together we plunged into the abyss. The sled flew like a shot out of a gun. The riven wind lashed our faces. It howled and whistled in our ears, and plucked furiously at us, trying to wrench our heads from our shoulders. Its pressure stifled us. We felt as if the devil himself had seized us in his talons, and were snatching us with a shriek down into the infernal regions. The objects on either hand melted into a long and madly flying streak. Another second, it seemed we would be lost. I love you, Nadia, I whispered, and now the sled began to slacken its pace. The howling of the wind and the swish of the runners sounded less terrible. We breathed again. We found ourselves at the foot of the mountain at last. Nadia, more dead than alive, was breathless and pale. I helped her to her feet. Not for anything in the world would I do that again, she said, gazing at me with wide, terror-stricken eyes. Not for anything on earth. I nearly died. In a few minutes, however, she was herself again and already her inquiring eyes were asking the question of mine. Had I really uttered those four words, or had only fancied she heard them in the tumult of the wind? I stood beside her smoking a cigarette and looking attentively at my glove. She took my arm and we strolled about for a long time at the foot of the hill. It was obvious that the riddle gave her no peace. Had I spoken those words or not? It was for her a question of pride, of honor, of happiness, of life itself, a very important question, the most important one in the whole world. Nadia looked at me now impatiently, now sorrowfully, now searchingly. She answered my questions at random and waited for me to speak. Oh, what a pretty play of expression flitted across her sweet face. I saw that she was struggling with herself. She longed to say something, to ask some question, but the words would not come. She was terrified and embarrassed and happy. Let me tell you something, she said without looking at me. What? I asked. Let us 
Let us slide down the hill again. We mounted the steps that led to the top of the hill. Once more I seated Nadia, pale and trembling, in the little sled. Once more we plunged into that terrible abyss. Once more the wind howled and the runners hissed, and once more, at the wildest and most tumultuous moment in our descent, I whispered, I love you, Nadia. When the sleigh had come to a standstill, Nadia threw a backward look at the hill down which we had just sped, and then gazed for a long time into my face, listening to the calm, even tones of my voice. Every inch of her, even her muff and her hood, every line of her little frame, expressed the utmost uncertainty. On her face was written the question, What could it have been? Who spoke those words? Was it he? or was it only my fancy? The uncertainty of it was troubling her, and her patience was becoming exhausted. The poor girl had stopped answering my questions. She was pouting and ready to cry. Had we not better go home? I asked. I, I love coasting, she answered with a blush. Shall we not slide down once more? She loved coasting, and yet, as she took her seat on the sled, she was as trembling and pale as before, and scarcely could breathe for terror. We coasted down for the third time, and I saw her watching my face and following the movements of my lips with her eyes. But I put my handkerchief to my mouth and coughed, and when we were halfway down, I managed to say, I love you, Nadia. So the riddle remained unsolved. Nadia was left pensive and silent. I escorted her home, and as she walked she shortened her steps and tried to go slowly, waiting for me to say those words. I was aware of the struggle going on in her breast, and of how she was forcing herself not to exclaim, The wind could not have said those words. I don't want to think that it said them. Next day I received the following note. If you are going coasting today, call for me. N. Thenceforth Nadia and I went coasting every day, and each time that we sped down the hill on our little sled, I whispered the words, I love you, Nadia. Nadia soon grew to crave this phrase, as some people crave morphine or wine. She could no longer live without hearing it, though to fly down the hill was as terrible to her as ever. Danger and fear lent a strange fascination to those words of love, words which remain a riddle to torture her heart. Both the wind and I were suspected. Which of us two was confessing our love for her now seemed not to matter. Let the draft be but hers, and she cared not for the goblet that held it. One day at noon I went to our hill alone. There I perceived Nadia. She approached the hill, seeking me with her eyes, and at last I saw her timidly mounting the steps that led to the summit. Oh, how fearful, how terrifying she found it to make that journey alone. Her face was as white as the snow, and she shook as if she were going to her doom. But up she climbed, firmly, without one backward look. Clearly she was determined to discover once for all whether these wondrously sweet words would reach her ears if I were not there. I saw her seat herself on the sled, with a pale face and lips parted with horror, saw her shut her eyes and push off, bidding farewell for ever to this world. Zzzz, hissed the runners. What did she hear? I know not. I only saw her rise tired and trembling from the sled, and it was clear from her expression that she could not herself have said what she had heard. On her downward rush, terror had robbed her of the power of distinguishing the sounds that came to her ears. And now, with March, came the spring. The sun's rays grew warmer and brighter. Our snowy hillside grew darker and duller and the ice crust finally melted away. Our coasting came to an end. Nowhere could poor Nadia now hear the beautiful words. 
for there was no one to say them. The wind was silent, and I was preparing to go to St. Petersburg for a long time. Perhaps forever. One evening, two days before my departure, I sat in the twilight in a little garden separated from the garden where Nadia lived by a high fence surmounted by iron spikes. It was cold and the snow was still on the ground. The trees were lifeless, but the scent of spring was in the air, and the rooks were crawing noisily as they settled themselves for the night. I approached the fence and for a long time peered through a chink in the boards. I saw Nadia come out of the house and stand on the doorstep, gazing with anguish and longing at the sky. The spring wind was blowing directly into her pale, sorrowful face. It reminded her of the wind that had howled for us on the hillside when she had heard those four words. And with that recollection, her face grew very sad indeed and the tears rolled down her cheek. The poor child held out her arms. The poor child held out her arms, as if to implore the wind to bring those words to her ears once more. And I, waiting for a gust to carry them to her, said softly, I love you, Nadia. Heavens, what an effect my words had on Nadia. She cried out and stretched forth her arms to the wind, blissful radiant, beautiful. And I went to pack up my things. All this happened a long time ago. Nadia married, whether for love or not matters little. Her husband is an official of the nobility, and she now has three children, but she has not forgotten how we coasted together and how the wind whispered to her, I love you, Nadia. That memory is for her the happiest, the most touching, the most beautiful one of her life. But as for me, now that I have grown older, I can no longer understand why I said those words, and why I jested with Nadia. Misery to whom should I tell my grief? The twilight of evening. Big flakes of white snow are whirling lazily about the street lamps, which have just been lighted, and lying in a thin, soft layer of roofs, horses' backs, shoulders, caps. Iona Potapov, the sledge driver, is all white like a ghost. He sits on the box without stirring, bent as double as the living body can be bent. If a regular snowfall fell on him, it seems as though even then he would not think it necessary to shake it off. His little mare is white and motionless too. Her stillness, the angularity of her lines, the stick-like straightness of her legs, make her look like a halfpenny gingerbread horse. She is probably lost in thought. Anyone who has been torn away from the plough, from the familiar grey landscapes, and cast into this slough, full of monstrous lights, of unceasing uproar and hurrying people, is bound to think. It is a long time since Iona and his nag have budged. They came out of the yard before dinner time, and not a single fare yet. But now the shades of evening are falling on the town. The pale light of the street lamps changes to a vivid color, and the bustle of the streets grows noisier. Sledge to Viborgskaya, Iona hears. Sledge! Iona starts, and through his snow-plastered eyelashes sees an officer in a military overcoat, with a hood over his head. To Viborgskaya! repeats the officer. Are you asleep? To Viborgskaya. In token of assent, he only gives a tug at the reins, which sends cakes of snow flying from the horse's back and shoulders. The officer gets into the sledge. The sledge driver clicks to the horse, cranes his neck like a swan, rises in his seat, and more from habit than necessity, brandishes his whip. 
The mare crags her neck too, crooks her stick-like legs, and hesitatingly sets off. Where are you shoving, you devil? Iona immediately hears shouts from the dark mass shifting to and fro before him. Where the devil are you going? Keep to the right. You don't know how to drive. Keep to the right, says the officer angrily. A coachman driving a carriage swears at him. A pedestrian crossing the road and brushing the horse's nose with his shoulder looks at him angrily and shakes the snow off his sleeve. Iona fidgets on the box as though he were sitting on thorns, jerks his elbows, and turns his eyes about, like one possessed as though he did not know where he was or why he was there. "'What rascals they all are,' says the officer jocosely. "'They are simply doing their best to run up against you or fall under the horse's feet. They must be doing it on purpose.' Iona looks at his fare and moves his lips. Apparently he means to say something, but nothing comes but a sniff. <sighs> what? inquires the officer. Iona gives a wry smile, and straining his throat, brings out huskily. My son, uh, my son died this week, sir. Hmm. What did he die of? Iona turns his whole body round to his fare and says, Who can tell? It must have been from fever. He lay three days in the hospital, and then he died. God's will. Turn round, you devil, comes out of the darkness. Have you gone cracked, you old dog? Look where you are going. Drive on, drive on, says the officer. We shan't get there till tomorrow going on like this. Hurry up! The sledge driver cranes his neck again, rises in his seat, and with heavy grace swings his whip. Several times he looks round at the officer, but the latter keeps his eyes shut and is apparently disinclined to listen. Putting his fare down at Viborgskaya, Iona stops by a restaurant and again sits huddled up on the box. Again the wet snow paints him and his horse white. One hour passes, and then another. Three young men, two tall and thin, one short and hunchbacked, come up, railing at each other and loudly stamping on the pavement with their galoshes. Cabby, to the police bridge, the hunchback cries in a cracked voice. The three of us, twenty kopecks. Iona tugs at the reins and clicks to his horse. Twenty kopecks is not a fair price, but he has no thoughts for that. Whether it is a rouble or whether it is five kopecks does not matter to him now, so long as he has a fare. The three young men, shoving each other and using bad language, go up to the sledge, and all three try to sit down at once. The question remains to be settled which are to sit down and which one is to stand. After long altercation, ill-temper and abuse, they come to the conclusion that the hunchback must stand because he is the shortest. Well, drive on, says the hunchback in his cracked voice, settling himself and breathing down Iona's neck. Cut along. What a cap you've got, my friend. You shouldn't find a worse one in all Petersburg. <laughs>, laughs Iona. It's nothing to boast of. Well, then, nothing to boast of. Drive on. Are you going to drive like this all the way, eh? Shall I give you one in the neck? My head aches, says one of the tall ones. At the Dukmasov's yesterday, Vaska and I drank four bottles of brandy between us. I can't make out why you talk such stuff, says the other tall one angrily. You lie like a brute. Strike me dead, it's the truth. It's about as true that a louse coughs. <laughs> Grins Iona. Merry gentlemen. Tfu, the devil take you cries the hunchback indignantly. 
will you get on you old plague or won't you is that the way to drive give her one with a whip hang it all give it her well Iona feels behind his back the jolting person and quivering voice of the hunchback. He hears abuse addressed to him, and the feeling of loneliness begins, little by little, to be less heavy on his heart. The hunchback swears at him till he chokes over some elaborately whimsical string of epithets, and is overpowered by his cough. His tall companions begins talking of a certain Nadezhda Petrovna. Iona looks round at them. Waiting until there is a brief pause, he looks round once again and says, uh, This week, er, uh, my, er, uh, son died. We shall all die, says the hunchback with a sigh, wiping his lips after coughing. Come! drive on drive on my friends i simply cannot stand crawling like this when will he get us there well you give him a little encouragement one in the neck do you hear old plague i'll make you start if one stands on ceremony with fellows like you one may as well walk do you hear you old dragon or don't you care a hag what we say? Iona hears rather than feels a slap at the back of his neck. He he, he laughs. Merry gentlemen, God give you health. Cabman, are you married? Asks one of the tall ones. I he, <laughs> merry gentlemen, the only wife for me now is the damp earth. Hey ho ho. The grave, that is. Here's my dead son, and I am alive. It's a strange thing. Death has come in at the wrong door. Instead of coming for me, it went for my son. Ionig turns round to tell them how his son died. But at that point the hunchback gives a faint sigh and announces that, thank God, they have arrived at last. After taking his twenty kopecks, Iona gazes for a long while after the revellers, who disappear into a dark entry. Again he is alone, and again there is silence for him. The misery, which has been for a brief space erased, comes back again, and tears his heart more cruelly than ever. With a look of anxiety and suffering, Iona's eyes stray restlessly among the crowds moving to and fro, on both sides of the street. Can he not find among those thousands someone who will listen to him? But the crowds flit by, heedless of him and his misery. His misery is immense, beyond all bounds. If Iona's heart were to burst and his misery to flow out, it would flood the whole world seems. But yet it has not seen. It has found a hiding place in such an insignificant shell that one could not have found it with a candle by daylight. Iona sees a house porter with a parcel and makes up his mind to address him. What time will it be, friend? he asks. Going on for ten. Why have you stopped here? Drive on. Iona drives a few paces away, bends himself double, and gives himself up to misery. He feels it is no good to appeal to people. But before five minutes have passed, he draws himself up, shakes his head as though he feels a sharp pain, and tugs at the reins. He can bear it no longer. Back to the yard, he thinks. To the yard, and this little mare as though she knew his thoughts, falls to trotting. An hour and a half later, Iona is sitting by a big dirty stove. On the stove, on the floor, and on the benches are people snoring. The air is full of smells and stuffiness. Iona looks at the sleeping figures, scratches himself, and regrets that he has come home so early. I have not earned enough to pay for the oats, even, he thinks. 
that's why i am so miserable a man who knows how to do his work who has had enough to eat and whose horse has had enough to eat is always at ease in one of the corners a young cabman gets up clears his throat sleepily and makes for the water bucket want a drink iona asks him seems so may it do you good but my son is dead mate do you hear a week in the hospital it's a queer business iona looks to see the effect produced by his words but he sees nothing the young man has covered his head over and is already asleep the old man sighs and scratches himself just as the young man had been thirsty for water he thirsts for speech his son will soon have been dead a week and he has not really talked to anybody yet he wants to talk of it properly with deliberation he wants to tell how his son was taken ill how he suffered what he said before he died how he died he wants to describe the funeral and how he went to the hospital to get his son's clothes he still has his daughter Anisia in the country and he wants to talk about her too yes he has plenty to talk about now his listener ought to sigh and exclaim and lament it would be even better to talk to women though they are silly creatures they blubber at the first word let's go out and have a look at the mare iona thinks there is always time for sleep you'll have sleep enough no fear he puts on his coat and goes into the stables where his mare is standing he thinks about oats about hay about the weather he cannot think about his son when he is alone to talk about him with someone is possible but to think of him and picture him is insufferable anguish are you munching iona asks his mare seeing her shining eyes there munch away munch away since we have not earned enough for oats we will eat hay yes i have grown too old to drive my son ought to be driving not i he was a real cabman he ought to have lived iona is silent for a while and then he goes on that's how it is old girl kuzma ionich is gone he said good-bye to me he went and died for no reason now s suppose you had a little colt and you were own mother to that little colt and all at once that same little colt went and died you'd be sorry wouldn't you the little mare munches listens and breathes on her master's hands iona is carried away and tells her all about it love three o'clock in the morning the soft april light is looking in at my window and caressingly winking at me with its stars i can't sleep i am so happy my whole being from head to heels is bursting with a strange incomprehensible feeling i can't analyze it just now i haven't the time i'm too lazy and there hang analysis why is a man likely to interpret his sensations when he is flying head foremost from a belfry or has just learned that he has won two hundred thousand is he in a state to do it this was more or less how i began my love letter to sasha a girl of nineteen with whom i had fallen in love i began it five times and as often tore up the sheets scratched out whole pages and copied it all over again i spent as long over the letter as if it had been a novel i had to write to order and it was not because i tried to make it longer more elaborate or more fervent but because i wanted endlessly to prolong the process of this writing 
when one sits in the stillness of one's study and communes with one's own daydreams while the spring night looks in at one's window between the lines i saw a beloved image and it seemed to me that there were sitting at the same table writing with me spirits as naively happy as foolish and as blissfully smiling as i i wrote continually looking at my hand which still ached deliciously where hers had lately pressed it and if i turned my eyes away i had a vision of the green trellis of the little gate through that trellis sasha gazed at me after i had said good-bye to her when i was saying good-bye to sasha i was thinking of nothing and was simply admiring her figure as every decent man admires a pretty woman when i saw through the trellis two big eyes i suddenly as though by inspiration knew that i was in love that it was all settled between us and fully decided already that i had nothing left to do but to carry out certain formalities it is a great delight also to seal up a love letter and slowly putting on one's hat and coat go softly out of the house and to carry the treasure to the post there are no stars in the sky now in their place there is a long whitish streak to the east broken here and there by clouds above the roofs of the dingy houses from that streak the whole sky is flooded with pale light the town is asleep but already the water carts have come out and somewhere in a far-away factory a whistle sounds to wake up the workpeople besides the post-box slightly moist with dew you are sure to see the clumsy figure of a house porter wearing a bell-shaped sheepskin and carrying a stick he is in a condition akin to catalepsy he is not asleep or awake but something in between if the boxes knew how often people resort to them for the decision of their fate they would not have such a humble air i anyway almost kissed my post-box and as i gazed at it i reflected that the post is the greatest of blessings i beg anyone who has ever been in love to remember how one usually hurries home after dropping the letter in the box rapidly gets into bed and pulls up the quilt in the full conviction that as soon as one wakes up in the morning one will be overwhelmed with memories of the previous day and look with rapture at the window where the daylight will be eagerly making its way through the folds of the curtain well to facts next morning at midday sasha's maid brought me the following answer i am delighted be sure to come to us to-day please i shall expect you your s not a single comma this lack of punctuation and the misspelling of the word delighted the whole letter and even the long narrow envelope in which it was put filled my heart with tenderness in the sprawling but diffident handwriting i recognized sasha's walk her way of raising her eyebrow when she laughed the movement of her lips but the contents of the letter did not satisfy me in the first place poetical letters are not answered in that way and in the second why should i go to sasha's house to wait till it should occur to her stout mamma her brothers and her poor relations to leave us alone together it would never enter their heads and nothing is more hateful than to have to restrain one's raptures simply because of the intrusion of some animate trumpery in the shape of a half-deaf old woman or little girl pestering one with questions i sent an answer by the maid asking sasha to select some park or boulevard for a rendezvous my suggestion was readily accepted i had struck the right chord as the saying is between four and five o'clock in the afternoon i made my way to the furthest and most overgrown part of the park there was not a soul in the park and the tryst might have taken place somewhere nearer in one of the avenues or arbors but the women don't like doing it by halves in romantic affairs 
in for a penny in for a pound if you're in for a tryst let it be the furthest and most impenetrable thicket where one runs the risk of stumbling upon some rough or drunken man when i went up to sasha she was standing with her back to me and in that back i could read a devilish lot of mystery it seemed as though that back and the nape of her neck and the black spots on her dress were saying hush the girl was wearing a simple cotton dress over which she had thrown a light cape to add to the air of mysterious secrecy her face was covered with a white veil not to spoil the effect i had to approach on tiptoe and speak in a half whisper from what i remember now i was not so much the essential point of the rendezvous as a detail of it sasha was not so much absorbed in the interview herself as in its romantic mysteriousness my kisses the silence of the gloomy tree my vows there was not a minute in which she forgot herself was overcome or let the mysterious expression drop from her face and really if there had been any ivan sidorich or sidor ivanich in my place she would have felt just as happy how is one to make out in such circumstances whether one is loved or not whether the love is the real thing or not from the park i took sasha home with me the presence of the beloved woman in one's bachelor quarters affects one like wine and music usually one begins to speak of the future and the confidence and self-reliance with which one does is beyond bounds you make plans and projects talk fervently of the rank of general though you have not yet reached the rank of a lieutenant and altogether you fire off such high-flown nonsense that your listener must have a great deal of love and ignorance of life to assent to it fortunately for men women in love are always blinded by their feelings and never know anything of life far from not assenting they actually turn pale with holy awe are full of reverence and hang greedily on the maniac's words sasha listened to me with attention but i soon detected an absent-minded expression on her face she did not understand me the future of which i talked interested her only in its external aspect and i was wasting time in displaying my plans and projects before her she was keenly interested in knowing which would be her room what papers she would have in her room why i had an upright piano instead of a grand piano and so on she examined carefully all the little things on my table looked at the photographs sniffed at the bottles peeled the old stamps off the envelopes saying she wanted them for something please collect old stamps for me she said making a grave face please do then she found a nut in the window noisily cracked it and ate it why don't you stick little labels on the backs of your books she asked taking a look at the bookcase what for oh so that each book should have its number and where am i to put my books i've got books too you know uh, what books have you got i asked sasha raised her eyebrows thought a moment and said all sorts and if it had entered my head to ask her what thoughts what convictions what aims she had she would no doubt have raised her eyebrows thought a minute and have said it all the same way all sorts later i saw sasha home and left her house regularly officially engaged and was so reckoned till our wedding if the reader will allow me to judge merely from my personal experience i maintain that to be engaged is very dreary far more than to be a husband or nothing at all an engaged man is neither one nor the other he has left one side of the river and not yet reached the other he is not married and yet he can't be said to be a bachelor but is in something not unlike the condition of the porter whom i have mentioned above every day 
as soon as I had a free moment, I hastened to my fiancé. As I went, I usually bore with me a multitude of hopes, desires, intentions, suggestions, phrases. I always fancied that as soon as the maid opened the door, I should, from feeling oppressed and stifled, plunge at once up to my neck into a sea of refreshing happiness. But it always turned out otherwise, in fact. Every time I went to see my fiancé, I found all her family and other members of the household busy over the silly trousseau. And by the way, they were hard at work sewing for two months, and then they had less than a hundred rouples worth of things. There was a smell of irons, candle grease, and fumes. Bugles crunched under one's feet. The two most important rooms were piled up with billows of linen, calico, and muslin, and from among the billows peeped out Sasha's little head, with a thread between her teeth. All the sewing party welcomed me with cries of delight, but at once led me off into the dining room, where I could not hinder them nor see what only husbands are permitted to behold. In spite of my feelings, I had to sit in the dining-room and converse with Pimenova, one of the poor relations. Sasha looked worried and excited, kept running by me with a thimble, a skein of wool, or some other boring object. "'Wait, wait, I shan't be a minute,' she would say when I raised imploring eyes to her. "'Only fancy, that wretch Stepanida has spoilt the bodice of the barege dress.' and after waiting in vain for this grace, I lost my temper, went out the house, and walked about the streets in the company of the new cane I had bought, or I would want to go for a walk or a drive with my fiancée, would go round and find her already standing in the hall with her mother dressed to go out and playing with her parasol. "'Oh, we are going to the arcade,' she would say, we have got to buy some more cashmere and change the hat. My outing is knocked on the head. I join the ladies and go with them to the arcade. It is revoltingly dull to listen to women shopping, haggling and trying to outdo the sharp shopmen. I felt ashamed when Sasha, after turning over masses of material and knocking down the prices to a minimum, walked out of the shop without buying anything or else told the shopman to cut her some half-rubles worth. When they came out of the shop, Sasha and her mamma, with scared and worried faces, would discuss at length having made a mistake, having bought the wrong thing, the flowers and the chins being too dark, and so on. Yes, it is a bore to be engaged. I'm glad it's over. Now I am married. It is evening. I am sitting in my study reading. Behind me on the sofa Sasha is sitting, munching something noisily. I want a glass of beer. Sasha, look for the corkscrew, I say. It's lying about somewhere. Sasha leaps up, rummages in a disorderly way among two or three heaps of papers, drops the matches, and without finding the corkscrew sits down in silence. Five minutes pass. Ten. I begin to be fretted both by thirst and vexation. Sasha, do look for the corkscrew, I say. Sasha leaps up again, rummages among the papers near me. Her munching and rustling of the papers affects me like the sound of sharpening knives against each other. I get up and begin looking for the corkscrew myself. At last it is found, and the beer is uncorked. Sasha remains by the table, and begins telling me something at great length. "'You'd better read something, Sasha,' I say. She takes up a book, sits down facing me, and begins moving her lips. I look at her little forehead, moving lips, and sink into thought. "'She is getting on for twenty, I reflect. If one takes a boy of the educated class and of that age and compares them, 
What a difference! The boy would have knowledge and convictions, and some intelligence. But I forgive that difference, just as the low forehead and moving lips are forgiven. I remember in my old Lovelace days, I had cast off woman for a stain on their stockings, and for one foolish word, or for not cleaning their teeth. And now I forgive everything, the munching, the muddling about after the corkscrew, the slovenliness, the long talking about nothing that matters. I forgive it all, almost unconsciously, with no effort of will, as though Sasha's mistakes were my mistakes, and many things which would have made me wince in old days moved me to tenderness and even rapture. The explanation of this forgiveness of everything lies in my love for Sasha. But what is the explanation of the love itself? I really don't know. Read by Alan Davis Drake in Cloud Mountain Studios.